Welcome to Inbox Talk. I'm your host, Liz. And I'm Evan. And today we're going to be talking about list health. It's a very uh, big topic. There's a lot that we're going to tackle today. Yeah, this is um, a long one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so put your seatbelts on, buckle up for this. Uh, there's just a lot that we want to cover from a very tactical standpoint yeah. on what you can do to control the list health, like generally what it means, how you can control it, and how you can make sure that you're monitoring um, as you continue to use Drip and engage with new people as you're going. Yeah. The way we're going to talk about it today is when you come onto Drip, what you need to know first and foremost, and then also from the consumer perspective of when they're joining your list, how you're obtaining them, what you do from an engagement level, and then at, at the end of their life cycle, if that day does come, what you do with them at that point. Yeah. So we'll start off with just getting people onto your list first. Yeah. Yeah. So if we just start with get, when you're getting started with Drip, um, the, the biggest thing I think that we want to educate some folks on is how you can properly bring your folks into Drip so that the the suppression list is set up correctly and that you're bringing in your list with the correct status. Yeah. So um, let's say that you've been with uh, another you know, email service provider before or another CRM tool. Mm -hmm. um, you'll probably have a list of people that are no longer valid, whether they've bounced, they've like requested to be unsubscribed, they've issued spam complaints, God forbid. Yeah. Um, you don't want to import those folks as uh, active users. You may still want them on your list, just so you don't end up accidentally adding them again, or maybe you're doing external marketing through like Facebook or retargeting ads, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, so the the best way to do that is is to have that as a, just a completely separate CSV file, um, and then go through and when you import that, you, we actually have the ability to import them as deactivated. Mm -hmm. um, that way they're in your list, but you don't end up emailing them the first time that you try and send an email to your entire uh, subscriber group. Yep, so although they're starting with a new platform, they're coming onto Drip as an ECRM, they want to bring in all of the historical context yep. that they have on their people from an email engagement perspective. Yeah, especially for things like historical orders. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there may be people who end up reactivating as well, and they want to get back on your list. Exactly. Um, especially during like the holidays. You know, sometimes people have longer buying cycles. Um, things like that, where you can still reference their old data, is really good to have. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we'll have some resources down below that you can take a look at on tactically step by step what you need to do for those folks. Um, but I think just as you're getting started with a new platform, really good to get off on the right foot yeah. and make sure that you're doing it in the proper way. Um, as we talk about it from the consumer perspective or the consumer life cycle, when we are thinking about not only just bringing in your historical people, but how we're obtaining new people, um, there's a couple things that we want to cover there. So. I'll let you maybe start off with the really fun topics so. of yeah the, the one of the one of the more negative topics unfortunately is um, the the idea of like buying subscribers um, you generally don't want to buy a list um, we're gonna talk about the importance of like getting explicit opt-in yep. like five minutes from now <laughs> um, but one of the things that can happen is people they they just want to try and reach out to as many folks as possible mm -hmm. um, we here at drip stress like you don't want to send emails to people who don't want your emails, um, whether that be that they're unengaged or that they have never heard of you before. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's kind of a recipe for disaster. Yep. Um, it can be, uh, it, it's one of the biggest things that can lead to like your account getting fully blocked from sending emails, which yep. again, we'll talk about in just a second, but um, really trying to make sure that the people that you're emailing know who you are and want to get emails from you. The worst thing that you can do for, to a consumer is land in their inbox and they're like, wait, why am I hearing from this person? Who are they? And it just, it it is a disaster down the road. So we want to eliminate that as as much as possible. So the, the best way that we're going to engage with folks is making sure that they're opting in explicitly and they're asking to hear from you. Yep. Um, there's a lot that you can do on the top of the funnel and from a marketing perspective to get your name out there and collect those leads. Um, but we want to make sure that anyone coming into Drip has said, hey, I want to start hearing from brand ABC. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so from a lead su uh, submission perspective, there's a few different things that we can take into consideration, like the double opt-in, recaptcha, those types of things. Yeah. You wanna give us a little bit of background there? Yeah, so double opt-in is a topic that comes up pretty frequently. Um, there's there's pros and cons to it, like a lot of different um, kind of setups out there, but the biggest thing is if you are doing double opt-in, um, sometimes it's legally required, depending on where you live. Mm -hmm. um, the In the EU, GDPR like mandates that you use double opt-in at this point, whereas in the US and North America, that's not a requirement currently. Yep. Um, the biggest difference in, with this is there may be people who opt into your site and they just never click the confirmation link in that email and so they never end up actually being on your list. Mm -hmm. One of the benefits on our end is that you don't pay for those people because they're like they have no way of getting emails, you have no way of tracking data on them. So they, they never don't, officially made it in. Yeah, they don't cost you anything, but it may end up making your list smaller in the long run. The benefit to that though is anyone who does take, make the effort to go through and actually click that link 
you know that they want to be on your list. Yeah. Um, this also tends to filter out quite a bit of like bot or spam submissions yep. because they may go in and enter an email address into your form, but very rarely will they ever actually go through and click the confirmation link. So there's a lot of good benefits to it, but it, it in reality will end up having a smaller list. Yeah, speaking from like the e-commerce marketing perspective, I'd say it's not all that common that we see like, you know, online brands putting in a double opt-in just because if they're showing interest, they want to capture it. They want to have as many people to talk to as possible. Right. Um, you're right. There are so many benefits to putting in that double opt-in and you're verifying and you're making sure. So it is good if you are able to put that into play. Um, if not, we do see quite a few people being successful. You'll just want to use the rest of the tactics that we have to keep that list clean after the form submission. Yeah. And and a lot of shopping carts now, like there, there is a like a, an additional checkbox mm -hmm. that you have to check in order to start getting marketing emails. So you may still end up on a list, and you could get things like abandoned cart emails, mm -hmm. but it'll exclude you from things like newsletter or like sales emails and things okay. like that. So um, you want to double check with what settings are available, depending on like how your setup is. But mm -hmm. um, in general, gathering that consent is like a really good way to make sure that those people are engaged. Yep. Yeah. And then they're going to stay that way too. Yeah. 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 Um, we, so we talked about double opt-in. Let's talk a bit about uh, reCAPTCHA. Yeah, this is, uh, it's a free service provided by Google. Um, they have a couple different versions of it. This is the, like the checkbox or the, you know, tell me how many of these images contain cars. <laughs> <Love> <laughs> um, that it, it, because it requires some manual input, it's um, generally not going to be something that is programmed around to like let in fake submissions, yeah. Um, especially some of the more like recent updated ones where you have to go through and select those pictures. Uh, I mean, if someone really wanted to, they could, but for general purpose stuff, like it's just gonna keep out a lot of the, the garbage emails. Yep. And we see quite a few of our e-commerce brands using that as well. So I'd yep. say both, it's, it's not that one's being used way more than the other, one works better than the other. I think it's a preference for what matches your brand. And if you wanna put these into play, it's gonna help from a list health perspective yeah. right from the get-go. Yeah. So. Um, perfect. So we do have a lot of customers that are going to trade shows, conferences, all of that. So it makes total sense when we're talking about online submissions and making sure that we're doing it in a clean way that way. Yep. How do how do people handle the conference piece of it? Or what, what do you even do to tackle that? Because it's a little bit of a tougher thing to do. Yeah, there's a couple of things that kind of fall into this category. Um, when, when we're looking at um, any, any source of emails that aren't an individual signing up directly to hear from you, mm -hmm. it gets a little wishy-washy. So when people go to conferences, maybe just to back up, they would be seeing potentially hundreds of vendors that are there. Right. They're signing up for the conference and they would have the potential to get added to all of those vendors' email lists, right? Yeah, it's pretty common that like when you register to go to a conference, they require you to enter an email address. Yep. And part of the agreement for signing up is that that email address will get distributed to every exhibitor there. Yep. Um, They're not explicitly saying vendor one, two, three, and four, five, six, I want to hear from both of you. Right. But you get included based on the initial submission to attending that conference. Yeah. Okay. Um, like as a best practice, you should be reaching out to those people individually. Um, and that may be like a, a direct email from someone at the company versus trying to do a mass email to all of those people mm -hmm. um, because you don't know anything about them. So that's not a great use of like our segmentation and automation tools. Yep. Um, if instead, you know, again, we've seen this happen more and more frequently where someone will have like an iPad at their booth and someone goes through and they like yep. enter that stuff or um, a, a little bit less concrete is like if you have a, you know, you, you like get QR scan or that or just like a, I almost want to say a tip jar, but for like, oh. business, for like business cards. Yep. Um, and again, again, a lot of those cases, like someone has to do an action. It's mm -hmm. not explicit opt-in because you don't have like a historical log of them doing it. Yep. Um, but again, like reach out to those people individually once they express, you know, push them to a form or get them, get their like, you know, interaction in some way, then go ahead and add them to Drip. Yep. Um, the same thing kind of goes for like social media stuff. You can farm a lot of emails from things like LinkedIn or Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, but again, those people aren't, reaching out to you to get that content. And so it's it's something that we don't generally recommend. Um, it is gonna it, happen, yeah. but it, just knowing that they're not quite as warm of leads to your business as what somebody coming to your site, landing on a form or filling out a lead submission form and you know another variety would be would be engaging, right? Yeah, um, it's not the same as like someone adding an item to a card. Yeah, it's, it's, exactly. it's prospecting almost. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, I know a couple customers that I've worked with, they've gone to conferences and they do like the QR codes or some sort of scanning. So they have to show, they've they've opted into the entire conference. Oh, it's like the They badge. have to show the badge. Yeah. Um, and then that's their version of doing it. So they do have a digital, you know, their footprint. Footprint, yeah. exactly. So it hopefully more and more conferences will start to do that and more, you know, vendors will be able to, to do that. But I think it's been interesting to hear even just over the last few years how things have been changing too. Yeah. Um, there's a couple other topics that kind of come up as well with like co like co opt in promotions yeah. um, or like affiliate marketing things like that. Um, again, like if it makes sense for your business or it's something that like it's a product that you're selling, um, that's generally a good sign. You know, it's something that that you are promoting because it's yours. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, again, you you want to make sure that these people actually want to hear from you first. Yep. And it just understanding that they're not as warm of leads. So you want to understand that when they come in, tag them or, you know, add in a data point in some sort of way so that, you know, you can keep an eye on those. Yeah. Um, so if we're talking about bringing people in, of course, we want to do it in the best way possible. If say a new customer is coming on board with us and they, you know, had some bad opt-in practices before coming on board, or they have a really disengaged list, or it's just been a while since they've taken a look at their list health, a uh, pretty generalized term, so I'll put the air quotes around it. <laughs> what what are we looking at, or what's your team looking at when they're coming on board and they start sending with this? Yeah, um, the it's unfortunate, but there are gonna be times where um, the sending on your account will just be flat out stopped. Mm -hmm. um, we understand that this is like business impacting and can, and, like if it happens at the wrong time, can, cost a lot of money. Um, so we try and resolve this stuff as quickly as possible, but. And we wanna educate ahead of time so that it doesn't come to that point. Right, but. right, right. Um, but yeah, generally, um, e either like when you first sign up for an account, um, there are things that can cause your account to get blocked or after your first send is the other spot that we normally see it happen um, due to like an unengaged list. Yeah. So some of the stuff we look for is like, if you have a ton of spam complaints come in or really high bounce rate on a send, um, those are the two things for your, for like the first email that goes out. Um, you know, if you hadn't screened your list, if you hadn't talked to them in nine months, um, it can, you know, we've seen cases where half of someone's list bounces and that's, it's going to hurt you in the long run. Yeah. So everything that we can do to prep on the front end, get that suppression list properly done, making sure that if you have any list of like we don't know if they explicitly opted in or like kind of the unknown factors. We don't want to email them first. We want to email those most engaged people and make sure that we're, we're doing things in a healthy way. Yeah, okay. exactly. Um, and it's a, from like a, you know, bounce rate, spam complaints, there's a lot of different pieces that go into there. So if it were to be a situation where they do, you know, get their account pinged and that we're seeing, you know, horrible engagement, we yeah. would work with them one-to-one -to, -one to let them know what what exactly triggered it and why it's happening and what we can do to remediate. Yeah, get in contact with our support team. Um, there'll be like a pop-up that says, you know, like your sending has been blocked yep. um, inside the account. So just reach out to us. Um, they'll get you connected to the right team. Um, that may be me directly. That may be the other folks who work on our deliverability team. Yep. Um, but yeah, the, like the goal is to get that fixed as quickly as possible yep. because we're not, we're not trying to stand in the way of you making money. Exactly, so. exactly. So as we start talking about sending with Drip and we look at the world of email marketing, um, a common practice that people come to us doing is that like batch and blast method. Yeah. Um, the way that Drip is set up and what we want to see people engage with and usually why you guys are ending up on Drip because you want to send those personalized emails at the right yeah. time to the right people and get away from that casting one message to your entire audience. Yeah. Um, so when you're getting started, I guess any advice as, as people are getting started with the moving away from bat batch and blast and getting those personalized emails out first. Yeah, um, I mean, in some cases it does make sense to send a list-wide email out. Um, again, there's huge sale events or holidays that you, know, you may want to still contact your entire subscriber base. Mm -hmm. uh, but going through and doing segmentation is gonna be more so getting that right message in front of the right people at the right time. Yep. Um, so building out automations that kind of are based off of um, individual people's actions as opposed to just doing you know, a weekly email is, yep. um, I mean, we see results from that very frequently, so. Yeah, I think my team's whole focus is to make sure that people get an understanding of how to utilize the automation yeah. so that you're not reliant on logging into Drip every day, sending out an email to your entire list and hoping for the best. Uh, we wanna, again, speak to those people as they're taking actions and in that right moment. So if they've gone in on a Monday morning at 9 a.m. and abandoned their cart, of course, that email is not going to go out to everyone. We're going to have an automation set up to properly walk them through, 
Two hours later, they'll get an email personalized to them on what they've left. Um, and that's really just gonna help overall engagement and help us continue to monitor the overall list health. Yeah. Um, so if you haven't already taken a look, I would say also take a look at the shareables page that we do have with the workflows that are pre-built for you. Um, those are what, you know, internally we're using all the time. They can be customized to yours, to your business as well. Um, but a really good starting point if you're brand new to automations and you don't know how to get away from that batch and blast yeah. method, um, really good starting point. So as we start talking about sending to your people, watching engagement rates, all of that, um, the thing that comes to mind from a list health perspective is really how do you monitor that like over an entire engagement versus from one specific email? Yeah. Um, so when I think about it, I think that there's, you're monitoring the engagement rates and then you also have a pruning or sunsetting operation that's working right alongside that. Yeah. Um, and that's where our team spends a lot of time diving into pe or diving into this with individual customers on how do they even set that up? Yeah. Um, from my perspective, I think it's, it's usually a like, flip of a coin of like, they've been monitoring it and they're very well aware of it, or people are brand new to learning about this and we're trying to educate kind of like from a one-on-one course perspective. Yeah. Would you agree? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, I, I, I mean, 50-50 or coin toss is a pretty good um, analogy for it. Cause it's, I mean, there's been people who've like, great, this list is 15 years old and we've never taken anyone off of it. It's like, all right, cool. We got <laughs> we some got work to do. <laughs> so don't worry if you find that that's you and you're watching this video, we will help you through it. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think it, it's something that once you start to monitor, it's really, really good to continue to figure out, you know, when are people engaging? When are they disengaging? At what point in the life cycle are they, you know, ready to be sunset or, yeah. you know, how do we re-engage them to make sure that they don't have to be? So um, from an engagement perspective, it's something that, again, we're talking to them when they want to be spoken to. We're not just blasting them all these emails and looking every seven years to see, did they open any of them? Yeah. Um, so what we want to do is, um, if it's if it's something that's new to you, we want to set up an initial op a pruning operation to kind of clear out the existing um, bad players, I guess, or to clear out the existing gunk from your list. Yeah. Um that that's going to require you to have been on drip for a while for us to be able to have that sort of data so if you have um, like open information from your previous platform right before you moved yep. that can be useful um but at least if if you've been with drip for again like we we tend to use 90 days as a good benchmark because if yep. they haven't done anything with you in, in 90 days pretty good indicator yeah exactly um but with pruning operations we base a lot of that off of email activity mm -hmm. and that's the built-in operation for it um, so again, if they haven't if they haven't opened or clicked an email in 90 days, that's going to be where they'll kind of get on that list. Yep. Um, with most, especially with ecom customers, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of other factors that kind of indicate if they're you know interested. Yeah. Um, the biggest one being if they've bought stuff from you, you probably don't want to get rid of them. Keep those people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, we have instances where there will be people who have not opened an email for 90 days, but because you're doing like Facebook ads to them, yeah, you're retargeting them. Exactly. Yeah, they're still getting that info. The like that stuff in front of them and then buying, uh, they just don't check their email. Yep. Um, or in a lot of cases, like their Facebook email is not tied to their actual inbox that they're looking at, yeah. but they're still valuable customers. So um, there's a lot of nuance that kind of goes along with that. So whenever we kind of have conversations about doing a printing operation, um, it's very important that like, if you have, you know, special sites or like they're attending live events, yeah. you're not just gonna be like, oh cool, they haven't opened emails and delete them. Yep, exactly. Um, we wanna layer it with those other data points that you do know about these customers yeah. or ways that they have been engaging. Yeah, and you're gonna know that better than than we will from kind of the outside perspective. And so that's always something to kind of consider. Um, but that's, that's where talking through it with either support or the SM team is gonna be um, yeah. beneficial. Yeah, and I'd say, again, that pruning operation side is more of like that one time encapsulate everything and kind of do your immediate cleanup or your 90 days into drip cleanup and get caught up. Yeah. What we really like to talk about is a true sunsetting method um, where you've got an automation going. It's again, personalized to when those people are getting to a point where we figured they're a little bit disengaged. Um, so take a look at the shareables. If you haven't already taken a look there, you'll see some good framework already built out, yeah. but that's building in the decisions and considering great, have they opened any emails? Have they done anything for the last 90 days? Have they made a purchase? Have, we're, we're kind of including those decisions in there. Um, and if it is getting to that point where, you know, they haven't made a purchase, they haven't engaged with any emails, we're, we're sending them a series of emails to try to re-engage them and get them back to a healthy point. If they're still not doing anything at that point, then it's time to say goodbye, move on to your, you know, other best selling or yep. best purchasing customers, I guess I should say, or best engaged customers. Um, but we don't want to just 
determine, hey, based on this, we're just gonna kick them off. We wanna give them that opportunity to re-engage with them, mm. the brand themselves. Um, so yeah, so I'd say take a look at the resources that we have there. Again, we're happy to, you know, our support team and my team and deliverability, all of us together, we're, everyone here at Drip is here to support you in figuring that out, but you should be given some good framework to get, at least get started. Yeah. Um, and I'd say that's a, a really kind of forgotten about tool that is available out there. So the earlier you, that you can get that started, again, it's running in the background. You don't have to do anything manually. You can focus on the rest of your business as that's happening in real time for each of those people. Yeah. It's a really nice method there. Yeah, so um, uh, stressing this again, like every business is going to be different. And um, the, the the example that we always use as like kind of the, the weird out there one is sensory deprivation tanks. Um, I use this because it's like they're $10,000. I don't know if I've heard this before. Okay. Um, and so if someone's going to buy this product, they're going to they're going to think about it. They have to have a house. They have to have the space for it, all those sort of things. And so your sales cycles may be a year and a half long. Yeah. Um, so point. pruning after 90 days does not make sense for you. Um, so all of this, uh, especially with the sunsetting stuff, is customizable. Yep. Um, so if, again, if you have a longer sales cycle, if you have something where you know that you have an audience that only, you know, engages every 45 days or something like that, um, or you're, 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 or 365 days. Yeah. 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 Um, you can change all of those sort of things to, to what makes sense for you. The goal here is to make sure that like you are not keeping people who you know after a certain point just are not likely to buy from you yep. just sitting on your list um again like the more that you're emailing stuff into the void that just doesn't get picked up yep. the worse off your ability is to get emails in front of people who are actually going to read them yeah exactly we want to focus on keeping the healthy people there making sure that we're not wasting our time with people that aren't yep. so Perfect. Well, if there's any other questions, please let us know. We're happy to help tackle this with you. Um, use the resources below and we will talk to you next time.